about a month. This one, uh, actually, I saw her about a month ago, and then she was treated here. I was on vacation, and she was treated here, and then she went on vacation herself, uh, taking care of her wound herself. Interestingly, we were talking about it because she mentioned her wound was dry, which obviously, as you see, it is quite dry, with uh, complete with necrotic slough on, sitting on top of it. Uh, she did indicate, and like many patients, they're, they're very happy that the wound is dry because they think if you form a scab, even though this is not a scab, but it, it looks like a scab because it's a dry covering of the wound, that it indicates progress. And yes, um, years ago, that's what we did to heal wounds. We put heat lamps under them. We did everything to dry them out. We put gauze on them. That's why we hate seeing open wounds putting gauze on it because the purpose of gauze is simply to pull moisture out. If you've got something really wet, gauze is great because it's going to just suck the moisture out of it. And that's why a lot of these wounds <laughs> do very bad with just gauze on them. So what I'm going to do here before we do her treatment, and she's having pulse lavage also, uh, is I'm going to do a little bit of sharp debridement to see if I can remove any of that necrotic slough. But if we're just assessing the wound, looking at it right now, Obviously, it's 100% necrotic. It would be the inflammatory phase of healing. No drainage. Uh, she does have, the edges are not attached. She does have some non-pitting edema um, around surrounding the wound. Obviously, not too bad. Uh, as compared to some of the other legs that we saw today, is the surrounding skin is much better. You don't see that real fragile, puffy tissue looking like if you touched it, it was going to open up. She has a few varicosities, but not bad. So in general, you know, a very good looking leg, just with a dry wound on it. Mm -hmm. When you do debride, of course, the, the main rule of thumb is if, if you're hurting someone or it's bleeding, uh, you probably are, need to stop and reevaluate what you're doing. The debridement always is done in, in layers. You never go down deep into the wound to cut. You just essentially want to work from the top down. Sometimes when you take these, this off, you, you're often surprised. You may have a deep hole in it. Or every once in a while, you find a wound that actually doesn't look too bad underneath it. So there's no real prediction on, on how this is. Kind of, people often ask, how long do you debreed? And I generally say the patients are a good guide. Uh, generally, I'll never debreed longer than 10 minutes. I think that's too much time after that for anyone to tolerate, but sometimes it's quite a bit shorter. Patients often ask, you know, why don't you deaden the area bef you know, before you do this? And generally because of the areas I'm removing are dead, uh, they don't really have too much discomfort. Sometimes I think the feeling of the pulling of the tissues may cause discomfort, and a lot of times the surrounding tissues are very painful. You see she's got quite a little hole here. You know, a lot of times if you don't remove, obviously if you don't remove the necrotic tissue, it's going to be harder to heal. Well, I mean, the wound needs to heal from the bottom up, and if it's filled in with this necrotic tissue, it's not going to be able to do that. In addition, whenever you have necrotic tissue, it increases the bile burden or debris, if you want, the chance for infection to occur. Many of these wounds are a very high risk for infection simply because of the necrotic tissue present as well as the biofilms that are also present on these wounds. These wounds often run into the category of not being infected but critically contaminated, meaning that they have such a high degree of bacteria present that they're just a hair breath away from being infected. So with the use of silver products and cleaning the wound, removing the necrotic tissue, all help promote healing and reducing the chance for infection occurring. Thank you. Measure from wound edge to wound edge, so we could see uh, here different ways of measurement. Some facilities use the clock method, which is 12 to 6 uh, and 3 to 9. At our institution here, they do longest by widest. So our longest here it looks like it's one centimeter, and it's, it's like 0 0.8. Width. To measure for depth, generally use a Q-tip. Yeah, this I didn't have. 
You want to set it just till it hits the bottom of the wound. Some people like to do that and then put their thumb, which is pretty inaccurate. Uh, so I try to just to somehow with a pen mark it and then bring the tip. So we're looking at 0 0.5 in depth. So the measurement is 1 by 0 0.8 by 0 0.5. Ready to get down to business here. Are you having any pain with your wound? No, I just did. Can you probably, uh, when the least success? aspects of wound care are uh, now taking more and more interest. In fact, it's even been called the fifth vital sign. And there has, um, I guess now two years ago, there been an international statement put out on the dress and how the care for pain in the wound. There are many different paints, uh, scales available, spaces, numbers. Um, this was a recent study that shows Actually, that it didn't matter. It didn't matter which paint scale that you use, whatever's mm -hmm. most appropriate in the patient's mm -hmm. life is best. And okay. they have even found that patients uh, with dementia were able to respond to certain paint scales, such as the face. some slough at the bottom at the base of the wound. If I had tried to debris that, it would cause. Uh, probably damage to maybe the underlying tissues, as I say, you know, everything isn't needs to be done in one day. When you get to a death like this, there's a lot of blood vessels there in the, um, beneath the surface, and if you can't see what you're debriding, then you shouldn't be debriding it. So she's at a point now where I don't know what's directly mm -hmm. below this. So we're going to use a little, an enzyme to help promote some faster debridement. I could just as well, and there's studies that say yes it's so, and studies that say no it's not that using a hydrogel is almost just as fast as using some of these enzymatic debriders. So again, all of it is clinical judgment. Uh, sometimes the patient's pair source where they can afford an expensive enzyme versus a hydrogel versus size of the wound. Um, all makes a difference in, in what you do. And the key, if you find that what you're using isn't working, you need to change. And too many people, I think, miss that part of the clinical picture. They don't think, what can I do if this isn't working? They just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And as, as a professional, that's not what you can do. It's your responsibility and ethically to figure out or seek references or referrals to find out what else can do to help promote the healing. Modifications are very important in nursing. Once we evaluate our interventions, if they're not working, you really have to focus in on the modifications. What do I have to do? Nothing. If you want to take a shower, you either I have to. I don't have to. I can hang out Monday. Okay. <laughs> or you can take it on Monday. When you, you'll be back on Monday. Yeah. So, so if this gets wet, that's okay. It won't get macerated because it'll be such a short time. So. Um, no, I can leave it. That's fine. That's perfect. Yeah. She also, because she has a little swelling, we've been putting, um, this is called tuba grip. It's a very light compression. Um, Compression dressing, compression wrap, tubular wrap. This only has between 10 and 15 millimeters of compression versus your high-end compression stockings if you're trying to manage um, varicose veins and the such are up to the 40, 45 amount. Important that you always educate your patients on how to wear them. They're supposed to be from the base of their toes to the, the bend of their knee. If you left it down like this, it would act like a tourniquet, and so you would start seeing these marks. Same with uh, these kind of hose that patients just love. But again, you can see on her, this is the mark from her little stockings. No good. That's no. not good. So they either need to be uh, loose enough or sometimes split a little bit. I have some cut, yeah. yeah. See, there you go. Cut, there you cut, go. Again. Or buy yeah. queen size. <laughs> cut it. Oh, queen so again, size? Mm -hmm. So again, putting them on, you have to make sure everything's smooth and nice. Not so many in this size. 
Once in a while, patients will say they cannot, you know, they can't tolerate even this light compression. And I always tell them, then take it off. And mm -hmm. You're not to, you know, spend the next two days suffering. You know, we'll, we'll start all over and figure out what we need uh, the next time I see you. And and pain. If a patient tells me they're in pain. I always believe them. Pain is very subjective. Uh, I've seen very severe wounds looking like they have. They should be very painful. And patients say no. Very small ones that are, you know, they, it's almost like life threatening how it feels to them. So believe your patients; they know, and you can learn a lot from them too. <laughs> All right. Thank you.